Hi, this is Brian Usman, and you are about to see Slasher Pepper. Enjoy. <laughs> hey guys, Slasher Pepper, and welcome to another video. Today, I'm going to be interviewing Brian Yuzna. How are you doing? Good. I'm doing great. Awesome. I'm glad to have you on the show. Um, my first question was, what are you up to nowadays? Well, a lot, I mean, developing stuff, and, and I also sell movies. I also help people make their movies. Myself and my partner um, have a company called Dark Arts. And we help help people who really don't have any connection to the industry, but have, I don't know, an iPhone and, a, and After Effects and, and Final Cut Pro or something, and help them... Um, main thing act kind of as producers reps we um we help them make the deals for the for the um for the sales and also we'll even start from script advice and production advice and editing advice so i do that and i also am working on a, on a um developing with a British company, a TV series based on society, which was the first movie I ever directed, um, kind of a cable series, um, amongst, um, you know, trying to get another reanimator sequel, and, and amongst many other things. I, nice. Many, many projects, I just need money. Right. <laughs> awesome. Sounds very cool. Um, and then to look back, at the things you've already accomplished um, in terms of making movies and stuff. Uh, what movie that you worked on are you most proud of? Oh, that's a hard thing to say. It's like people always say it's like asking which of your children is your favorite. <laughs> right. You know, it's, it's an impossible question. It's a, it's a fake question. Um, you know, obviously, you know, Reanimator is, is, is still such a um, kind of classic horror movie For um, sure. that, that in fact, my first, the first movie I produced professionally ended up, you know, kind of hitting it out of the park for me. There's nothing I could have wanted more as a horror fan to um, make a horror movie that's one of the classics. And, and as time goes by, it's, it's not it, it becomes clear that it's not just a movie that was very kind of successful and um, amongst horror fans when it came out but after I don't know what is it 30 years or more 40 years it um, it still holds up and it's still kind of a kind of a classic horror movie you know so that's sure. certainly great um, I certainly feel really good about society which is the first one that i directed um having i mean i had no no business producing movies because i've never i did you know i, I never took a class in film i never knew what i was doing <laughs> but i had even less um less reason to direct because of those same things the thing about a producer is the producer doesn't have to know anything, um, but a director kind of should, should know something about how you make a movie and, or how you direct actors, how you tell a story, how you, I learned from just working with other directors. Right. Um, so I'm really happy about that one because it, um, I think it's very original and it was the opposite of Reanimator. It was kind of a big dud when it came out. I was shocked. I thought everybody in the world was going to love this movie. Um, it did do well in in um, in the UK and some places in Europe, like France, Spain, Italy. But it, in the US, it was just nothing. And of course, this was before the internet or anything, so you didn't know what was going on. Yeah. <laughs> so, and the reviews were pretty bad, and I just felt you know, really kind of sapped from that. I was so disappointed. But then about um, 20 years later, about 12 or 14 years ago, all of a sudden it began 
kind of, um, I don't know, kind of discovering another audience, yeah. a younger audience. And now it's, um, it, it's quite, um, you know, it's quite accepted. And, is, um, and it, you know, that's very gratifying. And I know from, from just being a horror fan that it's got stuff in it that nobody ever did again. And right. I love that about it. I just think it's, and it's kind of very original. Um, For sure. An original monster, let's put it that way. And that was one of the things I loved about that, about doing that movie is that I was conscious of thinking, you know, I'm not just doing a werewolf or a vampire. Or, this is like an original monster. And boy, that's tough to do. It's hard to come up with a new kind of creature oh, yeah. in the horror movie world. But that is, it's hard to be original about anything, of course, because For sure. there's so many people working on so much. And so that's certainly been a good source of gratification for me. And then, of course, um, on a more mainstream level, um, so when I um, originated Honey, I Shrink the Kids with Stuart Gordon, um, that when we designed that whole movie, it was, um, it, you know, that is a different type of thing. It, it, I mean, it's a big studio picture, but the idea that our ideas became kind of iconic in kind of Disney movies, you know, the kid riding on a bee and on an ant, and and that's kind of uh, it, made, it. When I first saw a McDonald's cup with the kid on the bee promoting Honey I Shrunk the Kids. I went, wow, I can't believe that. It's like, you think that somehow I always thought that culture or merchandising or, or you know, what's out there in the world is sort of separate from me. You know, that that's something that's out there and then I do my thing. But when you see it happen that way and you realize that it's, I mean, of course we were just in the system. I didn't have anything to do with, with them merchandising that no yeah but the fact that you go hey i know where that idea came from right and then that kind of makes you feel like hey maybe i am a part of the world this yeah. is possible and that's especially for someone who who never you know i didn't start getting into movies until i was in my 30s you know it wasn't like all my i know people who from the time they're 15 years old they've got one goal you know and they pursue it but that wasn't me. I had lots of interests. I did lots of things. And um, when I finally ended up getting into movies, um, I didn't have any. I, I learned from books. You know, that's the, the generation I was. That's how you learn things. When you needed to know something, you got a book. Yeah. <laughs> and learning how to make movies from books is almost very difficult because right. <laughs> the process of making movies is, is evolving all the time all the time and so it's um you know i i'm kind of somebody who you know just learned from from doing you know and trying to stay in the game you know so you know so that's another part of it I, I mean i could go on and on but i'll, I'll leave it at those i feel like it's from the 80s yeah <laughs> i feel like doing is the best way to learn things though i've i've uh, noticed that myself from um like being in film school and then going on an internship uh like recently i learned way more from the internship than from mm -hmm. and by actually doing stuff and filming stuff than you know, from reading the books in school and getting tests and everything, you know, I feel like doing is a way better method to learn stuff. Yeah, the thing I always encourage is that um, I think that the hard part is learning the business. And by business, I mean how to how to do what you want to do and make money at it. However, right. you get into it. Um, and there is no there, there is no kind of like firm structure for it. Um, but what you really want from whatever you wanna do and within the movies say, um, is that you want an audience. I think that's the big thing. And the thing about making commercial movies, you know, not, I mean, you could go make art movies and 
put them up as installations and you'd still be looking for an audience. That's a different business. In the commercial movie business, you kind of can tell, in a way you can tell how good a movie is by how many people watch it. Yeah. But that doesn't, that doesn't agree. That doesn't mean that the movie, there's another level of a movie being good, so to speak. Um, but because if you don't, if your movie isn't seen by anybody, in a way, it'll, it can't ever prove whether it works or not. Yeah. You may be very proud of it. You may feel like it's a really great movie. You may not know until if, if your own um, opinion is the only thing that matters to you, then you're, then you're safe. Right. But if you, but generally people get very disappointed when other people watch their movie and don't have the reaction that you would like. And I learned this from the, I would call it, I guess, my student film before I got into, before I was doing, before I made any money making movies, uh, it was the late seventies. And I was, um, I had an art supply store. I used to paint paintings and I, I did many jobs. I was a carpenter at one time. I built houses. I, I did lots of different types of things. Um, and one of the, th at one point I ended up, I was doing also photography and I had a black, uh, a dark room and printing my own prints. And I did it more like as art stuff, not for like make, taking pictures for a magazine. And, um, and I ended up with a 16 millimeter Bolex camera um, in the seventies when the video cameras first came in, the news um, channels, um, TV, the TV channels, their news departments, they used to all use a 16 millimeter wind up Bolex that had three lenses in the front that you could turn and you'd wind it up and I think it gave you a hundred feet of film. And that's what they would carry to the, they didn't have sound. And um, they were dumping them because everybody was getting video because with videos, they didn't need to um, develop the film. Yeah. It was instant, right? These big video cameras with big cartridges. So these Bolexes, they were kind of almost giving them away. I ended up with one and found someone who had gone to film school to help. I started shooting with it. At that time I lived in the country and I had like a herd of goats, you know, and I would shoot my goats, you know, with this black and white 16 millimeter film. And then I'd, I had a projector and I'd watch it. And man, to me, it looked like Bergman. <laughs> <laughs> it was like black and white and it, you know, it just looked like something great, you know? And so then I wanted to make a movie and I wrote, I wrote a short film based on a short story a friend of mine had written. And um, it was called Self-Portrait and Brains. It was about an artist that puts a dynamite in his mouth and blows his head against the walls to make a painting. And then he comes back as a hologram. And, um, and so I found someone to help me make it. And that's how I started learning how to shoot, right? And we went up to New York. I lived in North Carolina at this time and we drove up to New York and rented a flatbed editing system. And, and we went through the whole process of finishing this short film um, and um, including sound mixing. And back then, you know, you had to have the lab. You, you couldn't do anything yourself. There were no computers, you know, everything right. was done on film, on yeah. mag tape. And, um, and so, so we, um, so I finished the movie and I, um, I put it on a VHS tape, uh, which was something kind of new back then and took it to show my friends, you know, and we sat down and I put it in and I just thought it was the greatest thing in the world. I, I just thought, I, I just really thought it was great. But the minute I started watching it with my friends, I realized it wasn't any good because they were trying to like it. Yeah. And they, you know, it's kind of like faint praise. Like you cannot be damned by any more than you by faint praise. <laughs> 
And it really struck me. And I think that's, and then I realized that when I saw it with others, then I saw that it wasn't good. And, you know, since then, I used to, back in the 90s when I was making a lot of movies, I used to, when we finally finished the final sound mixing of the movie, the final print of the movie, you know, final answer print of the movie, when it was done, I would get a copy of it on video and I would go watch it at my, alone, and just really enjoy it. And it would be the only time I would really enjoy the movie. Nice. Because after that, it was it was never going to live up to, to what I wanted from it. But there's a time when you can just believe whatever you want watching it. You see all your choices, all the, you know, everything about it. And so I guess that's my point about you should learn the business because if nobody sees the movie, then you won't even know if it's any good. At least I wouldn't. Some yeah. people may have stronger aesthetics than I do, but I always wanted people to, to like the movies I made or that I worked on. And I think that you want them to, um, you know, I think you want to have an, I don't know anybody that doesn't want to have an audience. They want people to recognize what they do. And that's not just in the commercial world, in the art world, all artists work for yeah. recognition. They just want to be hailed for writers. They just want to be hailed or you can just work for money yeah. <laughs> and not care what anybody thinks about you. And um, I think most people who actually do that, the most people who make a lot of money don't want anybody to know who they are. Yeah. <laughs> because because that's what they're working for. But people who are involved in creative stuff, uh, you know, somehow we fall into towards the extreme of wanting recognition, wanting and wanting people to to like what you do. And of course, if you make enough things that get bad reviews or you or um, you know don't live up to what you want, well, then you have a, you may have a tendency to kind of become a cynic and act like I don't care, you know, it's, I, that made me some money. You know? <laughs> and I think that that's you know I think someone like Roger Corman, for example, he's certainly not a cynic. But I remember when I was in junior high school and when he was really making movies back in the early '60s, his movies really had a lot of ambition. You know, um, the um, the man with the X-ray eyes was just like just very close to being kind of a breakout picture. It was really, really a, a good, uh, I mean, he really had a lot of ambition. And then his Poe series, they really did really well. I thought they were really good. They really were good for me. But after a while, after he sold, uh, I think his company was New World Pictures, um, he, um, he then started Concord or something. And he started like, it didn't seem like he was putting that much into him. You know, I feel, right. I felt like the last one that he really, really devoted himself to was um, uh, the, the um, um, Frankenstein Unbound, which um, probably you've never seen. But it was like Roger it, but... Corman is now going to come back and he's going to make a big movie because this guy never has any money. He always makes cheap movies. But when he gets a big budget, boy, we're going to see something because there's this there's this cultural narrative that that uh, there's a couple cultural narratives that go with movie making. One of them is that the that if all the suits and all the money people and all the bureaucrats who just get out of the way of the director's vision, we would have wonderful movies. For sure. And, that's, and so that's all feeds into this idea, ah, oh, the director never gets to do, they just had the money that the big corrupt, big movies had, they will do something amazing. I've never seen it happen, actually. In my experience, I don't see that. Frankenstein Unbound was a huge disappointment. <laughs> but I kind of feel like after that, Roger Corman just started figuring that he, you know, he's going, well, I'm making movies. They're filling a niche. 
you know, and um, and I'm making a ton of money. If you notice his his biography was called what did you call? I made a thousand movies in Hollywood and never lost a dime. <laughs> <laughs> nice, <laughs> awesome. Well, you were talking earlier about like how you find it important to have an audience. Um, do you feel there are any of your movies uh, that are sort of overlooked or you think are kind of underrated or wish would get more recognition? Well, yeah, most of them, Almost, you know, the vast <laughs> majority. Yeah. Um, it has to do with the, it has to do with the, with the way, I mean, movies, there's thousands every year, new ones. Yeah. How are you going to keep up, right? How do you get attention? How do you even get out? Exactly. How do you get the shelf space? So, for example, you could probably, you could probably invent the best chocolate bar ever, right? You could get in your kitchen and you could fix it. You'd find just the best chocolate bar. Everybody gives you loves it. But if you can't get space at the supermarket checkout. Exactly. It doesn't matter. You need <laughs> shelf space. Yeah. You know, you need if you're now theatrical is pretty dead, but you know, if you can't get your movie in the movie theater, it's not a theatrical motion picture. Back when Blockbuster ran the video business, they used to read the scripts before the movies were made to give their notes and then they would guarantee so much shelf space. How many how wow. much shelf would, will your movie have? Because people go, you go in to buy something. If you're going to once again to the grocery store, there may be three different brands of olive oil or of cereal or whatever it is. You choose from those. You're just looking for cereal. So if you're going to get a video for the, you know, you want to watch a movie, you're going to go to the movies. The multiplex just has 10 movies. That's what you're going to watch, one of those. You don't get to choose the movies that aren't there. You probably don't even know about them. So I think that the thing about low-budget movies, it's not just that they're probably not going to be very good because they're, they're low-budget. Um, so all the level of, of technical and artistic expertise that's going to be in that movie is probably going to suffer from the fact that you can't afford you know the you know the more experienced or more talented or whatever um so there's that and then the second thing is of course that because it's low budget nobody's nobody is standing to lose any money unless they try to promote it and because they're not going the 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 budget is already low so the risk is very low yeah and so why do you but to promote a movie it costs a tremendous amount you know i mean even you know on the big movies they it can cost 50 80 million dollars to promote the movie well when you're making a movie for a million dollars or five hundred thousand, or the way people do today how are you getting, who's going to risk money on that yeah right how do you get any attention well today people get on youtube or they have their different social media stuff they try to get followings they try to you know build up um build up an audience from that the first most famous version of that was the blair witch project yeah which was a which was during that it was a very elementary internet at that time but that was the kind of the first viral campaign and it was just incredible a movie that cost I'm sure, well, I mean, very little, much less than a million dollars. Yeah. I think it took in like 35, 40 million just in the U.S. I mean, that's yeah. an incredible, incredible thing. And it was because, and it was just because they made people think that maybe this was real. Maybe it was real footage. And um, so, cool. so, so that's, you know, that's getting attention. Um, for example, I did a whole line of films in Spain in the 2000s called the fantastic factory and when i went there to do that i took the spanish company and introduced them to trimark pictures which has now been bought up by lionsgate and they had trimark had 
had um, hired me to direct three movies by that time. So I had a good relationship with them. And I went to them with four titles to, for them with the Spanish company and to launch the label. And I asked them to pre-buy them. And so the Spanish, and they did. And the Spanish company was just so shocked that they could sell just the titles with no movie that they, and of course they charged very little. Well, because they charged a little, those four movies, when they when Lion when Lionsgate got them, instead of promoting them and spending any money on them, they just they just licensed them to the Sci-Fi Channel for more money than they paid for them. Nice. <laughs> and now they made some money. So why are they going to go through the trouble of putting it in movie theaters? Putting yeah, there's no reason for it, right? And so that's the way the business can either support or hurt you. Um, a guy that I worked with, who you might have heard of, called Dan O'Bannon. Oh, yeah. Dan O'Bannon yes. was the screenwriter of Alien, most famously, and, and director of Return of the Living Dead. Um, and he's a really creative, crazy guy. And I remember he, he was telling me when I was working with him that he, when he negotiated to make a movie, he would write and direct. Um, what he wanted was he had they had to guarantee a certain level of distribution and promotion. And because he didn't do it on a movie, and his movies lost, right? Because they they're not obliged. These the companies are they're just looking to keep the cash coming in. They're not yeah. going to go take a chance on something. That's um, so that's part of the problem with getting an audience. One, you're nobody, so you're you don't really have the crew and the artistic team to um, you don't have the the resources, both financial and personal, to make a product that can compete. And then secondly, because it's so low budget. And you don't know about the business, and because it's so low budget, well, you're not gonna. Who's going to invest in promoting your project? Yeah, you know. So usually, what you want to do is get a um, get somebody involved in the beginning. So, for example, one of the projects I'm working with uh, is with a writer director named John Penny, who I met because he wrote Return of the Living Dead for me. And that's where I met him. And he um, and I are helping a Canadian producer produce kind of a double feature of films that he wrote both of them. He's going to direct them both. And we're helping her um, get a package together for her investors. And one of the things we had to do was was get, I mean, we had to get a budget, find out where to shoot it, how you can do it, um, and, um, and especially get a sales agent. But get a sales agent before you make the movie. Because if you make the movie and then you go try to find somebody to sell it, they'll kind of go, okay, well, I could get so much money for this. Doesn't matter to them if you lose money or not. Most people lose money on movies. So if you're thinking about investing your life savings in a movie, you're probably, it's very likely you're going to lose money, but you, yeah. you want to lose as little as you can. And most people are doing it because they think, well, then, then I'll have a track record. Right. And go from here. And, but the, uh, but you, but if you don't get the distribution first, well, who's going to pay attention to you? Yeah. You've got one movie, you come around these sales companies, they have to have, you know, they go to these film markets. You know, there's three, four big ones every year. One in Berlin, one in Cannes, France, one in Toronto, one in, in, in Santa Monica, California. And they, every market, they have to bring new movies to sell to their clients. So they need three or four or five movies like three or four times a year. Your one movie 
maybe it maybe it's maybe they can handle it. How much attention are they going to put to it? You don't know um, because it's one movie, and unless it's like kind of a surprise hit. And secondly, by the time they take it out to one or two markets, they've got new pictures to push. And right. they'll sell what's easy to sell. And then they're not going to spend a lot of time trying to trying to sell the territories that are difficult. That's called, you know, the low hanging fruit. You pick the low hanging fruit and then go to the next fruit tree. You don't right. have to climb up in a ladder to get those because there's another tree there. Yeah, you know, you want to get those. So, you make your movie. It's such a big thing to you. It's like me showing my little short to my friends. It's, it was such a big thing to me that it was hard for me to then look at it through their eyes, where it was just something more on a television. Right. Another thing on a television, and does it match? I don't know what's so what's so significant about it. So that's that's where it really gets complicated in in making a living making movies. You know, it's a um, you know, I mean, you could, like I said, you should talk to Jan Dunstan, Mr. Horror, about yeah. House of Nether Horror, and you will hear about a Dutch um, project for genre films that he put together, and you can see where the problems. You can see what a challenge it is, not from the fact. Of course, you can make a movie. If you have if you have a rich uncle gives you the money, you can make a movie, right? <laughs> yeah. But can you can you get the money back? Right. If you can't get the money back, if you're well, you've got a good hobby. Nothing wrong with that, you know. But if you want to be professional, the definition of professional is you make money at it. Yeah. So that's the um, that's where it's hard. And most people, and people don't, of course, we don't want to hear that because you didn't go to film school so that you could learn about the film business. You went to film school because you want to be an artiste. And you exactly. Want to be a director and you want to make, you know, I don't know, Night of the Living Dead or <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, whatever movie you love, right? Yeah. Awesome. I love the example of like the low hanging fruit. That's like such a good way to visualize it basically <laughs> and um like you mentioned before reanimator 4 um what is that all about can you tell us more about that well you know it's funny because i have um i i i developed so many reanimator projects i don't know why i haven't been able to make them I, i'll tell you you would think right you'd think wow this is a kind of a franchise or something Yeah. Well, the reason there hasn't been a lot of reanimators is because I own the property, and there's not many, not many horror properties of much value that are actually owned not by a company. Uh, reanimator is one. The other one would be Phantasm, <laughs> which has never been has never been owned by a big company. So, if a big company owned reanimator it would have been sequel to death long ago yeah <laughs> say the howling right the howling oh yeah whatever, you know um children of the corn so, yeah yeah and once the company has it they can just they churn it but of course when you have someone like me to whom it's all very personal and you know it's like your little baby or something <laughs> and plus i'm trying to You know, I don't want to do something that the fans wouldn't like, right? Right. Be embarrassed, right? Right. Um, but so I tried for 20 years, probably now, or a little less, to make another movie. And believe me, I've I've developed a lot of stuff. <laughs> And one of them, the one that got the closest, um, was just about five years ago was one I, I called Reanimator Unbound. And uh, after Frankenstein Unbound, right? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it would have been the same. <laughs> But it was like really crazy, really far out there. And it was about West having, for the first time in his life, having a, um, having a, um, all the money he ever needed because he's working for the Black Ops now. And he's making augmented soldiers in this, 
far off place in an underground lab, and he built himself a hydrogen collider. You know, and of course things go wrong. And um, it was based on my original idea was to do a trilogy after Beyond Reanimator. One would have been House of Reanimator that Stuart Gordon was going to direct, uh, which was Reanimator in the White House. Nice. And I never could figure why we couldn't find it. So. Um, and then the second was going to be Reanimator Unbound, because after the White House, the Black Ops give Wes oodles of money to build this super lab to make you know, these augmented soldiers um, that were controllable. And of course, he had his own experiment going on that takes us, that, that kind of um, rents the fabric of, of time space. So you kind of get more to a Lovecraftian thing. And then the third one was supposed to be called Reanimator Begins, which was that Wes is, um, is, Ends up after Unbound, he's like in some foreign lunatic asylum, kind of lost his mind, and he gets sprung from there by this this doctor who takes him back to Switzerland, and turns out she's the granddaughter of Dr. Gruber. Nice. She's got his notes, and she wants to recreate them, and Wes has to try to remember. You know, he's he's got amnesia, so we basically are seeing. A, the prequel to reanimate. You know, awesome. And that. But without being able to finance any of it, the closest thing that right now I'm trying, I'm work, I'm getting, I'm negotiating with a company to do basically an adaptation. You know, more like the third one. And the second one is huge. The Unbound. The White House. I don't know. To a certain degree, after Trump, I just don't know how you can do anything. <laughs> You know? Right. <laughs> you know? um, but the, um, and also, I, I, I never, you know, it, for me, it was never a political thing. I think horror isn't really political. Or I, although you can read stuff in, you can read cultural things into horror. Sci fi can be really a political type movie, but mm -hmm. horror to me is always, it's um, psychological. It's, um, you know, it's sex and death, you know, it's religious. It's, it's not about current affairs so much. Yeah. Um, but, um, but the Unbound was just, is, I guess, too different, too big and too different. And now, so now I'm working on one that's more contained and back to Miskatonic University. And awesome. We'll see. We'll see. Awesome. Sounds promising. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I mean, it's all promising. Unless you have money, it's not promising. Yeah, true. <laughs> I mean, the last Reanimator movie was released when I was born, so it's been long enough. <laughs> Imagine. Yeah. Uh, and then I was wondering, I'm a big fan of your movie Progeny. I really love that one. Oh, wow. And... Um, like the message that I interpreted from that movie, at first I was like, why are the aliens doing this? But then there was like one line in the movie and I'm like roughly quoting it. I don't know what it was exactly, but it was something like, um, how do you figure animals like being tested by humans? And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, now it makes sense. So that was kind of the message that I got from the movie. Um, what was like the message you were trying to tell with that movie? Well, I don't know. You know, it's funny. It was a, that was a project. That, and that's a movie nobody ever mentions. Yeah. Right? Because they, it kind of came out at the wrong time. If it had come out 10 years earlier, when the UFO stuff, the alien abduction stuff was happening, it would have been, it could have really worked. You know, because I think yeah. it's a good movie. Um, but it was a friend of mine, Jack Murphy. I had helped him produce a movie called Ticks. I don't know if you ever saw Ticks, but if you haven't, you should watch it. It's about, about big ticks yeah. killing people. You know? <laughs> and, um, and, the, um, and Jack wanted to have this idea of making a movie called Proj, and he had a script written. And it was about an alien abduction where, in, where a woman is impregnated by an alien. And, um, 
And it was, it was kind of a difficult script. It was hard to really focus on. It ended up being kind of a killer baby movie in a way. Um, and I suggested that we talk to Stuart Gordon to help with it. Because Stuart was the guy that I would always go to for story because he just is a really good storyteller, or he was. And, um, and he immediately had this, this idea, which I thought was brilliant, which was, you know, with these alien abductions, people usually have a period of time that they forget, like they don't, that they can't account for. And, um, and so Stuart had this idea to make the whole movie be based on that missing time. Yeah. And which made it seem like a real story. The thing that made it tricky for me, and, and what and we read all the main alien abduction books, you know, there's all these there's all this literature about about, you know, about aliens. Um, I guess not you I guess UFOs are just when you don't see the alien, right? But the um but they were about, you know. That they've been made into movies like Fire in the Sky, and I forget the other one, Communion, or whatever. There were a lot of, um, especially in the 90s when X Files was the big movie of uh, the big TV series. Yeah. The, um, but what I learned, and, and I talked to people who, had, who said they'd been abducted. So I interviewed people, and some were like, you know, like the district attorney in LA, you know, you know assistant district attorney, you can't go, whoa. You know, and I read about how alien encounters change around the world, like different countries have different versions of the aliens, but they all sort of have this same narrative structure. And what I, what I came to decide or what, I, what, what my logic arrived at was that making an alien abduction type movie, an alien movie, it's very similar to making like a haunted house movie, a ghost movie. And the reason is that a good haunted house movie, and by the way, my, I would say that the best haunted house movie ever made is The Haunting, directed by Robert Wise from the 1960s. Um, the main thing about a haunted house movie is that you, you kind of never see the ghost. You get close. And the whole thing about a, a ghost story is it's not, it's supposed to make you think, oh my God, it could be real. That's, yeah. that's what you're selling. You know, with horror, you're selling, oh you know, my God, you know, it's a visceral yeah. kind of horror. You see the fluid, you see the, you know, the, ha the haunted house just makes you think, oh my God, this could be real. You know, if you show the ghost, then it starts becoming a monster movie. It becomes a creature if you actually right. see the ghost. Yeah. So it's like you're always getting closer and closer. And the the greatest ones, it's usually the main protagonist, ends up being haunted herself, right? Yeah. Um, but the alien abduction, it's very similar. You, The whole point is to, if you read the books and stuff, it's kind of like, it's thinking, oh, it could be real. They, they could be out there. They, they could be here. And then, but if you actually see it, it becomes kind of a sci-fi movie, which is something different, right? When you see it. And so it's kind of like, and I think what, what that gimmick of the abduction that um, the movie eventually had, I think that what makes it kind of still stay in the alien abduction mode is that it's all very psychological <laughs> yeah you know it's like you're watching two different versions of reality and and the 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 one version and the one that i was really happy to deal with in it was i liked the scene where the man the husband and wife were in the car coming back from i forget where and um from the shrink or something or or maybe her her checkup and and she's and he's and he's skeptical of her story and she says what you think i've been having an affair 
that because because he finds that he says no i don't have the sperm count to impregnate you yeah and she says well it was the alien and he's going if you've been you know she says is this what this is about you think i've been i've been screwing around and that it would be easier for him to accept that they were an, that it's an alien abduction than that she was unfaithful right i mean it's a it's, and so that part of it kind of makes you go, gee, this is, um, you know, this, you could look at it from different points of view. Yeah. The, um, the you know, and the way I tried to represent that in the movie was by showing shots that were kind of simulacrums that you could see two things at once. So for example, when he gets stopped by the, by the, alien border check <laughs> yeah <laughs> the illegal alien the cops look into his car they come down at him looking into his car and it kind of freaks him out and then when he wakes up at night and there's thunder and lightning the window looks like aliens and it looks like the cops you know so it's two things at once just like in the haunting when um when the um when the Two protagonists in the haunting they're in the house and there's something outside the door and it's beating and they, you never see anything but they show the the pattern of the paint and it kind of looks like a scary face you know it's like when you look at a crowd and you see an elephant in, you know right um, or if you're it's dark in the woods you might see the branches look like a demonic face the um i did that in a kind of not very good movie i made called um, initiation, Silent Night, Deadly Night 4, in which with Screaming Mad George, we did a lot of simulacrum, you know, to try to get into that mentality of sanity or insanity. What's, what is real and what is not real? And, um, and so that was kind of what the progeny ended up being about. The thing that was very frustrating about that movie was that I couldn't ever really let loose and I kind of just wanted that little progeny baby to to just take off and start killing people yeah you know, I just I just wanted it to do that but the minute you do that then it's kind of like you're in a different movie yeah <laughs> and, and by maintaining its integrity it um it really was um it I think that's why it's never it's hardly ever mentioned Almost nobody ever mentions progeny, and I think it's because they think, well, it's not weird enough, you know. Right. <laughs> they want it, they want things because I tend to do things much go much crazier with stuff, and that one by holding back, I think I think the movie is good, but it's not quite it's not quite delivering something that the audience wanted. So it's an interesting interesting movie. I haven't seen it in a long time. It was tough to do too, without because the um, because digital was too expensive for low budget movies back then. You know, Jurassic Park right. had already come out, but you couldn't afford that stuff. You know, it, awesome. it was, you had to like do stuff practically, and anything yeah. you did digitally was kind of didn't kind of look too good. You know, I bet. Well, I love that, and it's. I think it's such a shame that not more people talk about that movie within like the horror community because I think it's great, truly. Thanks. But yeah, I I feel like um, when you think of like your movie catalog, you you know uh, think earlier of like the Reanimator movies or Return of the Living Dead three, the dentist movies, you know, like that those movies are more like typical your style, I guess. Yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When you veer off, you know, that's, a, but that's, that's typical for everybody. You kind of end up having to, you need to, in a way, from a, from a, from a practical point of view, you have to stick with what you are identified with if you want to keep going. Yeah. You start jumping around to, I think a lot of people would like to think that they could just do any kind of movie. Yeah. And the, if you get up really high, you know, a big time, you know, say Steven Spielberg, probably the top version, he can do that maybe. He can make Jaws and 
close encounters and then he can make that horse movie or whatever. But when he, but when he veers too far from his kind of really kind of genre roots, um, they get, the movies get ignored. And I yeah. think most everybody's like that. I, I remember I once when I was working in Spain at the post house, I ran into his name, Tobax, T-O-B-A-K-S, a Canadian director who directed a movie that really impressed me in the, it was in the 80s, called The Gate. Did you ever see The Gate? For you, it'd be like a really old movie. Yeah. But he used <laughs> a lot of like foreground miniatures. It was a, a couple of kids and they go through a gate. There's all kind of weird stuff beyond the gate. Right? And I was, and it did, I mean, it was in movie theaters and it was really kind of impressive because it was a, um, because of all the, all the special effects tricks he did. And, um, and then he made another one, I think called I Madman or something. It looked like he was having a genre career. And then you didn't hear from him. And when I ran into him, he was working for Millennium Pictures doing the, I think he had an action movie or something. But he started working kind of on assignment, you know, just whatever, maybe he was tired of doing genre. Well, I mean, everything's a genre, but I call genre like horror. You know, yeah. Kind of stuff. And um, I think that, and I, and when I met him, I was really happy to because I was a fan of the stuff he had done. And I just realized that he's been working, but nobody's going to heal the only movies that probably of his that will have any recognition is still going to be The Gate. Yeah. Because it was in that genre. And if he had done an action movie right out of The Gate, you know, and it had worked, then you'd probably be doing all these action movies, you know. So there is something to that. I mean, think of Sam Raimi, who um, is one of the real originals. For um, sure. He made Evil Dead. I mean, that's one of the most original movies, uh, genre movies, and successful. And he did, immediately after he did, I think when it came out, it was called the ABC Murders. It was kind of like a or I think it was finally released as Crime Wave. It was like a lower budget kind of noir type thing and didn't really get any attention. And then he did um, um, Dark Man, which was a pre-digital superhero and did a good job on it, you know, given, I mean, superheroes never really worked until digital got good. Yeah. You can't do them. Yeah, they're just too gravity bound. The, um, the, and then he was produced, of course he did the Evil Dead 2, which was basically Evil Dead, but with money. Yeah. <laughs> and he um, was directing and producing Xena, the warrior, the warrior princess or whatever it was, the TV show. And I think in Australia. And by the time, but then he tried to get up into the, the big time, the real big time, the A-list, and he did a crime movie called A Perfect Plan. Oh yeah, I, I've and it seen was okay. Movie. I mean, it was good. It was good, but it yeah. was not. It was not Fargo, or you know, no. it was not out of the park, you know. And that, and then he was able, but that. So he wasn't going to get any more jobs like that. But then he got, you know, he did Spider Man which was kind of perfect for him because of dark man. Yeah. So he was able to broaden out a little bit, but a lot of people just can't do it. They, it's really hard to move out of what you're, what you're known for, you know, what, what it is that people identify with you. I think a singer musicians have the same problem. Oh yeah. You can't just take some heavy metal guy and now he's going to do his ballad or, yeah, like uh, well, Lincoln Park. Nobody's, nobody's going to accept it. Yeah, I mean, because they go, that's not what I'm looking for here, you know. Yeah. And, and I think that's something that. Um, luckily for me, I never had any other. I mean, I never really 
had any, I've never had any desire to move out of horror fantasy. I could do sci-fi, you know, I could do any in that area. I mean, fantasy is just, I mean, it's just, it's horror, but with brighter lighting. You know, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids with dark lighting and a negative ending is a horror movie. Yeah. My God, kids getting shrunk. And, <laughs> I mean, now what? This is horror, right. For sure. But you can tell fantasy can be magical. Yeah. It can be a good feeling. And that I feel like comfortable with. But, and sci fi, basically it's adding metal to things you know but i would i would have a hard time doing um i would probably lean it towards something weirder you know but i feel very comfortable with horror and i never really wanted to i always felt like it takes so much work to make a movie why waste your time on doing something that isn't horror i don't know you know I mean, that's how i feel <laughs> Because, you know, that's where, that's where my imagination goes. You know, yeah. that's where I feel most comfortable. Right. But a lot of people only do horror when they start out because it's easy to get into. Yeah. And if they, if it's, they don't, they're, they just use, they want it as a stepping stone. Right. Well, I'm sure that if I'd had opportunities, I probably, I could have been, led in that direction if that's where my business went but it didn't i stayed in the sort of the the big the big frog in the little pond kind of world right <laughs> i got to do every i got to do whatever i wanted but of course with a low budget you know and so what i tend to do is lean towards the lean towards the weird you know lean towards the horror nice yeah i feel like uh ari Asler. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he uh, he directed Hereditary uh -huh. and Midsommar. Uh -huh. And he's like doing a dark comedy now. So I'm kind of interested where that's where that's going to go, you know. Because... Might work. Might work. Exactly. Because Hereditary and Midsommar are both not quite, tr they're not traditionally structured commercial genre. They're, just, you know, they're, they're a bit more artistic. For sure. You know? Yeah. And so that, that could that could easily um, lend itself to doing non-genre, less genre stuff. Yeah. I guess we'll find out soon. <laughs> and um, well, what was it like working on Return of the Living Dead 3? Uh, that was really one of the, one of the best experiences I think I had um, making a movie because one, I didn't have to piece together the financing. Trimark had the rights, had the financing, and they hired me to produce and direct it. And I interviewed the writers with their pitches and worked with them to um, develop it. And the great thing was that, of course, they was that <clears throat> I basically developed the script with John Penny, who wrote it. And I was, I had, it was my production company. So they just put the money in my bank account. And then I was able to spend it according to our budget and everything. It's not like you can, it's not like you have, you can't, you can just do whatever, spend whatever you want. You have a yeah. approved budget and everything. I don't want to mislead people <laughs> there. You're, you're working closely with the with the company, the distributor, and I directed. So then I got I didn't have to negotiate with the director, you know, and um, so I got to kind of schedule and mount the movie within the budget that they approved, um, according to how I like to make movies, and I. It's the only movie really that, or the most, the movie that most turned out exactly like it was planned to be. Nice. So we had storyboards. We shot it just the way, we, we even redid the storyboards once we had locations. 
we, you know, I like to use multiple effects companies and a coordinator to work it out. We had six effects companies for different things. We, um, it was a, a good script. Uh, the effects were good. My effects coordinator, Tom Renoni, just did a terrific job, you know, because we, and I got to, um, I got to create my own mythology for the living dead because like I said, with that movie, I used to say that what I was, I was very aware that what I was making was the, the second sequel to the unofficial sequel yeah. <laughs> to the most influential horror movie of my time, which was, I, I break the, horror movie history i i think the modern era began with um, night of the living dead for me that's the movie that that kind of was that bound that that boundary for the kind of getting into it wasn't a it wasn't a rubber um effects movie uh, i mean when it, dawn of the dead came in tom savini came in and did those those rubber effects the real gory stuff and then in the 80s, it was all the rubber guys, you know, the heavy metal guys that like to use methacellulose and make weird things out of, out of plastic for effects for Nightmare on Elm Street and all those movies. But it was really what kind of, for me, was the classic movie. So when, and I had visited the set actually of Return to Living Dead before nice. I knew before I knew um, Dan O'Bannon, and he took a different approach. Um, he took the approach of um, making the EC comics, EC horror comics, like Tales from the Crypt, making a movie out of it. And until then, nobody had been successful in adapting horror comics to the movies. They would do movies like Creepshow, for example, in the 70s. And they thought that the way to make something look like a comic was you did it the way the old Batman TV show was. You really made everybody really colorful and sharp and bright lighting, empty frames, you know. They would even start with a page of a comic. Yeah. <laughs> but, that, but the old EC comics, which I used to buy when I was a kid, the first, before I saw horror movies, I read nice. horror comics when I was, and they always had brain eating and everybody was bad in it. And it was just really scary kind of comics but but funny even though as a kid you didn't quite read the satire but they were really satirical and um when dan made that movie i think that movie is the one that made tales from the crypt tv show possible because nobody he showed you how to do a horror comic book on screen and um and it was um just tremendous it was really fun um and so I really liked it. And I really liked the idea of being able to make a sequel to it after the second one didn't work very well. Um, the, um, and it was also a sequel to Night of the Living Dead, but it was an alternate because Romero did his own sequels. Yeah. And so, the, um, so it was kind of like, what happened was um, John Russo, the, the writer of Night of the Living Dead, ended up with the right, as I understand it, ended up to, with the right yeah. to the title Living Dead. And so Romero made Day of the Dead. Instead of calling it Day of the Living Dead, he called it Day of the Dead because he couldn't use the term Living Dead. Yeah. And Russo was trying to get his own sequel made. I even read, he had a, there was a, paperback book called return of living dead that i read yeah that's right time. and it wasn't anything like dan's movie it was about this school bus i think or something that rolls over in the first chapter and dan o'bannon worked with john russo to develop his version which was much more of a comic book version and kind of changed the rules because first of all night of the living dead was a straight ahead horror movie yeah it wasn't meant to be funny. It was kind of ironic, but it wasn't meant to be funny in any way. And then Dan O'Bannon totally made it funny, made it very colorful, made the monster, the zombies really unbelievably weird. Um, 
and um, also made some big changes with Romero. If you shoot the brain, it's dead. With Dan O'Bannon, you can cut off limbs and they'll still keep going. And yeah. Dan O'Bannon also, and it all came from a gas. With George Romero, we didn't know where it came from. We didn't know what it was, how that happened. With with Dawn of the Dead, remember the poster said, "When when hell is full, the all dead right. will walk the earth." What is that the best tagline for a horror movie ever? <laughs> I mean, really, that's just great. And that's the thing I miss with zombie movies, especially since 28 Days Later, is that it's all become about, um, it's just become about a pandemic. It's, all, it's become about being afraid of people because they're sick and they're going to get you sick. Just like Cabin Fever was like the pandemic version of Evil Dead. Well, I rushed my case. I'm way more of an evil dead guy. The, um, the idea that, um, you know, that the macabre aspect of what used to be the zombie movie is what I really like about it. Less than the, less than just the army of the dead type, I, you know. I mean, I love like Sam Raimi's um, army of the dead, you know, which, was totally macabre you know it's just a cult terrible. yeah i like sure. that i much less like a soap opera with people who are going to hurt you because they're going to infect you if they bite you you know that it's less it i don't know if the movie's good the movie's good but my preference is to have something a little weirder well the uh and the idea of that you know so that um Trimark, when they when I asked them when I was developing the script, I asked them what they what they required from the previous movies because the second the first sequel to Return of the Living Dead, they the investors um, who I understand were Japanese investors, they required they wanted to have the characters that had already been destroyed from the first movie. So that's kind of confusing. Yeah, and it had to be funny and all this kind of teenage sort of hijinks type thing, and um, it kind of did, it didn't work. It didn't have the that pizzazz that um, Dan O'Bannon's had, and so the whole value of the franchise sunk down to the level where they would trust it with me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and so I so when I asked them what was required, did I have to put certain actors in it? Did I have to have certain characters? Did it and did it have to be funny? Because I felt like I was making a sequel to both Night of the Living Dead and Return of the Living Dead. Yeah. So I didn't want to just do a sequel to Return of the Living Dead. I wanted it to in some way kind of communicate, you know, kind of recognize the original. Yeah. And um it that wasn't funny. So I guess that's why you know, usually I'm all about doing irony and, and kind of kind of dark humor. But for some reason on this, I just wasn't really. Well, I asked them. I said, "Do it? Does it have to be funny?" And they said, "No. Don't have to put the same characters. You don't have to put in the actors. The only thing we require is that you have the trioxin gas and that you have brain eating." <laughs> and it was hard for me to figure out the brain eating part because I thought that's just stupid comic book stuff how do you keep it serious how do you keep it kind of serious how do you make that not just be a joke and um and so then i came up with the idea that um which i also developed in reanimator on um beyond reanimator which was that the problem with zombies is that when they die they lose something. And you could call it the soul or Herbert West would call it the neuroplasmic energy, but it's something that it's whatever, you know, when a body dies, when you die, you're gonna weigh like 20 grams less the minute you die. And so you can say, well, what is that? And you say, well, it's, uh, that's actually whatever it is that tells your cells how to grow. Also then the zombie is somebody who's brought back to life, which should be nothing. You die on the operating table, you get brought to life. What's so scary about that? 
but they act weird. Why do they act weird? Because they've lost their soul. Now they're like a classic macabre zombie. But from a from a practical point of view, you could say, no, it's because now they're dying. The flesh is dying, but they're aware. And so in Dan O'Bannon's version, the best scene in the movie is when the half woman is saying, it hurts, it hurts. You got God, not only do you have to be brought back to life as an ab, ab abomination but you're and you're aware of it but it also is very painful right so that's yeah what's the word and so i thought well why does it hurt it's because they're they're dying they can feel the pain and the thing that dies the first in the body is the finest part of it which is the nerves and so that's what's dying. And what they're trying to do is, is find a way to augment, to balance that out. So when they, so I just decided that the reason the zombies are eating flesh, like in Night of the Living Dead or in Dawn of the, or in Return of the Living Dead, it's because they're not looking for the blood and the meat. They're trying to get the nerves. Right. And the most nerves are right here. <laughs> the head of the nerves and so that's why they're going to look for that's why they're going to eat the brain so once i figured that out then i could design julie i wanted to have a i wanted to have a character that was that the main character would be a living dead It'd be someone who was who was becoming you know kind of going down that road and so, because after I did Bride of Reanimator, I felt bad that the bride only came in at the last 15 minutes. I thought, yeah. wow, that was the best character. And then she's gone. So I thought, I want to do that character, but through the whole movie. And so awesome. that was, that's what I, John had the idea of this Romeo and Juliet story and the, and the, um, and the, he had the whole structure of the, of the military making a weapon and having the freezing bullet and all that. And what my main thing was, I just wanted the, the girl to be becoming a zombie and that the whole dynamic would be a love story, a doomed love story of um, someone watching, not letting go of loving their the loved one who is just becoming a monster. And I thought, well, that's kind of something we all can relate to. You know? Yeah. Um, if you've ever known someone who was a had a loved one who was a drug addict for example or you or maybe just mental illness you can see the pain of having to watch someone destroy themselves say and and so i think that makes it credible not that you not that it's a it's not a serious movie i don't want to get there it's a zombie no. movie yeah you know? it's a it's a horror movie but you want the love story to kind of work and to so i tried to develop a a logic for why she would do what she did but i already knew that i wanted how i wanted her to look and i wanted and john penny and i we would we visited fetish clubs to see you know that was when piercing and tattooing was just starting to hit it was like 1989 it was starting to become kind of come into the mainstream and the fetish clubs were where you saw this you know and i had i wanted to have this kind of a title character who would be a new kind of a new monster again right i wanted a clear monster and so it i like i couldn't do the tattooing because horror movies take place in one day you know two days yeah. but and I couldn't do scarification because it takes a while for scars to, to heal. But I could do scarification if they stayed bloody, right? And I wanted her to, and I just like this idea of the glass sticking out of her face, I think, because I always loved that movie Bloody Sunday by, um, that had um, by Mario Bava, that black and white one, what was the name of the actress, famous horror actress, where she has the mask put on her with the spikes in the openings in the prologue when they take it off she has all the little holes <laughs> in her skin 
when she's brought back to life. And it was just always so shocking, you know. She's beautiful, but oh, it's just awful. Yeah. And so I like that idea with the with the glass sticking out of her. I wanted metal sticking out of her. And so I tried to design her so that she would have like a rock and make these kind of blades on her hand so she would hit someone on the head and then dig out their brain right so there was a logic to her and then the idea that she cut herself was because the pain would keep the change back a little you know it's like people right. who cut themselves because of of trauma you know they have a childhood trauma and they will hurt themselves they'll cut themselves it's a problem you know and they do it because they have such emotional pain that they use the physical pain will push it back. And so I thought, well, if you're dying, <laughs> you have all that pain. Um, because he even says to him, you should have let me die. You know, why did you bring me back? Um, yeah. So she's sticking nails in herself, cutting herself to try to keep the change from coming. And then the only other thing that can hold it back is love. So that makes it a love story. But that can overcome the pain. I love that so, so that much. That became the logic of the whole of the whole story. You know? Yeah. I love just the the doomed feeling that you get while watching the film. Like you know, there's no way this is gonna have an hap a happy ending. <laughs> yeah. That's no way for it to turn it's out well. So tragic. And it is but you know too. the thing is. But the thing is, is that it is, but because it's a love story, love stories, the real love stories are tragic. You know, they always end before, like Tristan and Easel, or, you know, Romeo and Juliet, they, they it's, it's an impossible love. And that's more romantic than, oh, then they got married and had a bunch of kids and- Yeah. <laughs> kind of ruins the whole thing you know for sure yeah. i mean it's not romantic it's it's life you know yeah <laughs> but the romance is always actually mo the real romance happens before consummation right know? and so that's but of course you can't do that today it's a little unbelievable yeah but i prefer i really like the scene where he is in such denial kurt he's in such denial that he when they're down in river man's lair and he has sex with her or makes love to her and she has her hand and she has a blade of glass in her hand and as she squeezes it the blade is giving her pain so she can handle him <laughs> making love to her they're so in different places yeah you know and i think i i like i think that's a real that's really horror that's you know, because horror is all sex and death, basically. That's why that's why adolescents like it, because when sure. you're an adolescent, that's when you're you're becoming sexually mature, and also your body's changing. You have passions you don't get, and you start being aware of the fact that you're mortal, that you're going to die. And sex and death are you can't separate one from the other. But so. Uh, a horror scene that really puts those two together is, um, you know, I think that kind of becomes like, you know, kind of a high point for a horror movie. For sure. Yeah. And especially um, after, you know, Night of the Living Dead and Return of the Living Dead, there's such a contrast between these two movies. They're completely, well, not completely, but there's a big difference between tone and stuff. Oh, and between then, Night of the Living Dead and Return of the Living Dead, absolutely, totally different. I mean, really, Return of the Living Dead, I don't know, in a way, it, the only thing it shares with Night of the Living Dead is maybe just the... Um, the zombies. You know? The title. Yeah. The title. The creatures. the zombies but, are different. Remember, in yeah. Night of the Living Dead, they're more realistic. It's just, and they just come to life. They don't, they just come to life because they died. I used to think when I first saw it, um, I assumed that the saliva infected them. That's what I assumed. And yet, if you look at the movie again, you'll see that's not the case in the first one. 
and I'm not sure about Dawn of the Dead. Dawn of the I don't think either of them. I think they were both very much about um, if you if you die, then you come back because hell is full, whatever. But it was little by little like it started becoming more about like a cause and effect. I think I don't think it was so much. I think in the 28 days later, that was a post. AIDS kind of um, movie, and AIDS was sort of the 80s, and HIV AIDS. Um, that was a sexually transmitted um, kind of death sentence, and it and it was um, so that's something that made. I mean, because we lived for so long since World War II without where we were had vaccines, we didn't have polio, chicken pox, all these childhood diseases that used to kill so many people um, were had been kind of almost eradicated. But with AIDS, all of a sudden it was like, wow, that was, I mean, I remember before AIDS, dentists didn't wear masks and glasses, you know? After, yeah, they did. They're worried that your blood's gonna get on them and they're yeah. gonna have AIDS. And so I think that's maybe when this whole idea of being really afraid of other people um, that, because they could infect you. And of course, now with the, the coronavirus, it was really um, <laughs> taken to almost, sci, almost sci-fi extremes, right? Shut yeah. down the whole world for a year. That's really, I mean, it's just beyond belief. It just wasn't as dramatic. It's like with cabin fever, the, you know, cabin fever, it, you know, in, in Evil Dead, the, the kids, the young people, go to a cabin for a weekend. And when you see that cabin, you go, why on earth would you go there? Yeah. I mean, come on, it's a piece of shit. Yeah. It's awful, it's just awful. <laughs> why would you do that, you know? Go to a Motel 6, God, do something else. <laughs> yeah. But of course, that's what they could afford, right? Um, right. For cabin fever, same deal. Young people go to a cabin, but it's beautiful on the lake. And you kind of go, yeah, I could see that. Because in the, you know, if you look at um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, all the kids, that's the hippie era, all the kids are in a van. Yeah. <laughs> and they don't have any money. Are you kidding me? Right. They're just, they're traveling, man. <laughs> Maybe they'll stay in a tent or sleep outside, which is kind of what we used to do back in the 60s and 70s. But in the, in the, in the, um, so I think um, Texas Chainsaw reflected that, you know, Evil Dead reflected the fact that I don't know. I mean, I didn't know anybody that really had a, maybe you could stay at somebody's parents' beach house or something. I don't yeah. know. You couldn't rent a place. You know, your, your cars were usually crappy. You know, you didn't have any money. Um, but by the time the 2000s came along, young people had much more resources. <laughs> they had nice cars. They, you know, they, they had more, you know, it was, you couldn't imagine somebody in the year 2000 going and staying at an Evil Dead cabin or right. riding around in a van. <laughs> and, you know, they would have they would have very sophisticated stuff. It's almost like we're a lot richer now or something. Yeah. But the but the um, so with cabin fever, all of a sudden you're looking and you're going, yeah, I could see that that would be kind of an attractive place to go spend a weekend, you know, with your friends. But instead of it being this Lovecraftian kind of occult, totally soul-destroying fear, it's that somebody's got AIDS or something. One of them has a disease and you can catch it. And so the big horror is that I think she shaves herself and the skin comes off. So that's the big horror, right? Um, but they're killing their friends because they are sick. I never quite understood that logic. I mean, to me, it was kind of like, really? I don't see an immediate threat, at least at 28 days later, 
these guys get up and they yeah. <laughs> they're going to come and kill you. But in Evil Dead, the they would get the kids would get possessed and try to kill the other kids. You know, it's you know that was madness. And I think part of the, I mean, for me, one of the things I like about horror is when it gets when it gets close to to reflecting madness, to showing mad. That's the thing that's scary because madness is chaos, and it might be catching. <laughs> it would be like terrible to be mad. You know, right. Awesome. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I wanted to watch Gavin and Fever coincidentally like two days ago, but my DVD won my DVD player just refused to start it. So eventually, oh, really? yeah, eventually I watched House. Have you ever seen that one? Like, House. That's fun. Yeah, that's an yeah. '80s. Uh, I forget who directed it. It was a Vietnam guy. Yeah, but it's... it was it was those fun rubber effects from the '80s. Yeah, the dog. <laughs> running around with the hands uh, <laughs> i don't know it was i mean i love that kind of stuff it was only uh, it, it only happened for a brief period in the 80s and kind of got lost but it was it was a mainstream kind of horror movie at the time for sure yeah i love that one and um then what's the best advice you could give to young filmmakers I don't know. I guess I already gave you about a half hour yeah. kind of <laughs> kind of discussion of that. I don't think I could add any more to it. Awesome. It's, do it. I mean, just do it and do it seriously. If you're going to do something, try to do it as seriously as you can. You know, if you're going to try to shoot something, because like they say, you know, you can do it on your iPhone. But yeah, try lighting. You know, try dealing with light. You know, everybody now. They go, oh, I don't need to do any lighting because these cameras, they, they, you see what you get, you know, you know, I think, you know, when, you know, when I started, we would still go on stage and the film wasn't, you had to put a lot of light for the film to come out. It wouldn't just pick up what's in the room, but you'd get on a stage that would be empty and then you would build the set and bring in lights or else it would be dark and build the set the way you wanted to shoot it. And so what that meant was that everything you're doing is a choice. Whereas if you're just taking your camera and saying, oh, we want to shoot in this house, we'll go into the house and hey, looks good, you know, it, we don't need any lights or very little lights and it, we'll just shoot it the way it is. Well, you're not making many choices there which means that it's harder and harder for your movie to have a style to reflect you, to reflect the team that you have. And if you were forced to build a set, then you'd have to collaborate with an art director, with a construction guy, and decide what color you want to paint it, how you want it to look within the budget you have, how you want to do your shots. And for me, I kind of remember reading a book about Hitchcock, the life of Hitchcock, Alfred Hitchcock. And, you know, he started as an art director in the twenties. And he used to say that the, once you built the set, all the shots are built into it. And the best way to understand that is if you build a hallway, you kind of know where the camera's going. Yeah. You're going to shoot this way and you're going to shoot that way, right? You might get down, you might get up, but you know, you're if you build steps, you kind of know what right the shots are gonna be. And yeah. I I tried to use that to inform when I built sets. And for example, on Bright of Reanimator, I knew that they had to be I wanted them to be next to a cemetery. Because that's the way it was, you know, it's one thing from the stories we hadn't used yet. And so I, so I figured they were in a mortuary, in old, a house mortuary that was not working now, and that would have a basement where it would be the lab. But it's not, but I wanted it to be a very operatic kind of scene. So much of the movie would take place in that lab. And with the art director, we discussed it and 
laid out all the scenes that were going to be shot in that lab. And then first you had to figure, how can you make it real operatic when a basement usually has a low ceiling? You know, that's not very, you know, that doesn't give you that feeling of grandeur, right? Um, you can't do, you know, in Frankenstein, he has the whole tower. You know? Yeah. Um, so what the art director said was, oh, you know how to deal with that is we'll put big, heavy beams in the ceiling. So if we put something really heavy up there, that'll give it a feeling of something much more dramatic. And it was true. And then everything, we built parts, we designed that set for all the different scenes that took place in it. So we had the right background, like when West has his line about what God, you know, his great kind of moment, we put in these these air ducts that went out like a tree because I was imagining at the top of a mountain with a kind of craggy tree behind him railing against God. Well, with it, we just made those pipes go off like a tree behind him and we put that in there just for that scene. You know, when I needed a scene where where with Dan Kane, I would always, especially in the first part of the movie, he always had to go around tables when he went from one place to another in the lab because that made him weaker, more vacillating. Whereas West always had a direct, a direct line, you know. So there was, you know, where the bride was going to come to life, I made it a little curved, a curved um, wall with windows, you know, up at ground level so the light could come in and she would have a whole a whole platform to be brought back to life, you know. But that's you don't do that when you don't build the set. Right. You go down to the basement. Yeah. <laughs> and you shoot what's there. Now, does that mean it's not going to be good? Yeah, you could it can be a verite type scene. You could make it much more realistic. That's not what I was going for. I didn't wasn't going for realism by any means. But I think that that's, an, that's certainly an exercise to take. Awesome. Is to say, you know, take it seriously. Are you, if you, you know, everybody who directs a short film today is an artist, right? They're like some kind of genius. And, um, but, you know, they, they haven't even, they're not even craftsmen yet. You know, they're not even, they haven't, they're just, it's just because that's what the culture tells us. We want to believe that. And there's something to be said for, you know, why don't you do a movie where you actually build your set? Now, you can do the same thing by choosing locations very carefully. But, yeah. You know, if you build your own cemetery, it's going to look much cooler than if you go to a real cemetery. Yeah. I bet <laughs> you're going to do it just for what you, you know, the textures and the looks. If you, if you light it, it's going to look much different than if you just use available light. And if you, and the problem with, you know, if you're an up and coming or would be filmmaker, you're not going to have access to, to experienced actors. And so, and you're not an experienced director you don't know how to tell an actor how to act because you don't know what acting is yeah. i didn't when i started and so that means that if you're someone like stuart gordon who was a theater director for 12 years before he ever made a movie he can take people who are not actors and direct them and make them be credible but he can work with a really good actor and they'll be brilliant. A, a would-be filmmaker, you don't have the skills to, to direct people who aren't good actors. So that means you should get a good actor, but how do you get them? Yeah. You don't have any money, can't pay them. Even right. if you can pay them a lot of actors, they won't do it because they don't want to be in something that, that doesn't turn out well. So I think there's also this, you know, I think that if you're going to make a, a um, you know, your own film, one thing is maybe you shouldn't write it yourself. Right. <laughs> maybe you should, maybe you should try to find a story and get someone that is can write to adapt it. 
and don't do everything yourself. The other thing, you know, try to collaborate. The other thing is, and it's much easier for you to look at something someone else wrote and criti criticize it and change it than something you wrote. You won't change anything. Yeah. You won't have the criteria. You'll be like me watching my piece of shit little <laughs> short and thinking it's good. Right? Yeah. The, um, the, the, and then if you're going to have your actors, you know, you need actors and you're going to have your friends do it, right? That's who you're going to get. Someone who will show up, hopefully. And don't give them the job of playing something that they're, they've never lived. You know, it's better that they play a barista or a student or somebody that they have already been. Yeah. You know, something they recognize and then they can play it. Don't give them to play like a CEO of a big company. <laughs> yeah. never, you know what I mean? Yeah. You don't try to set the thing in a world that you don't know. Right. But to put it in something that you know, but I'm a big fan of being, um, of, being style of putting a style to things. So even if you had your whole movie take place in a in a college dorm or a or a coffee shop, you can shoot a coffee shop and make it look like something more than verite, more than just taking a camera into a coffee shop. You know, with costumes, with props, with decorations with lighting and make it have a style to it and that's i think doing that's a huge huge job when you've never done any of it yeah <laughs> you know sure it's a big big job but you know if you can just try shooting a three-minute thing but build your own set bring in your light then every shot you make where you put the light is a choice that's going to be your choice you know, you've decided what that's going to look like because you put the light there, you know, and that's a whole lot different than just shooting an available light, but it's a good exercise. at least. Awesome. Yeah. I never thought of that, but I definitely will keep that in mind and try it out someday. Well, you can always go to what well, you've been to film school. So they probably have already taught you a lot. You know? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> But never like built my own set or anything. I mean, of course, I've built my own like little light set, but not like decorations or, um, like I said, decorating like a coffee shop or something. Built a set like that, not too. Yeah, that well, it's difficult because it costs money. Yeah. But then, but then, ninety percent of the battle of making a movie is getting money. Yeah. So if you can't do that, well, then you know, that's the, that's the struggle. For sure, for sure. I think John Borman had a book. I think his biography was called Money for Light. <laughs> if you, a movie, you gotta pay for whatever's in front of that camera. You gotta, yep. You gotta <laughs> buy sure. it. If you can't raise the money, then go help somebody who can. Yeah, nice. Yeah, then I have some uh, philosophical questions. Um, do you believe in life after death? Well, I mean, I think that there's, I don't think that what we, what we, um, I don't think what we're aware of now is all there is. I think we have limited sensory organs and we take in a um, filtered, filtered experience that we call reality. And um, I wouldn't, um, be surprised that that um, awareness exists outside of that. Nice, awesome. Um, if aliens attack, what would we do? Die? <laughs> I mean, come on, really? Are you telling me that someone who could come from further out than we can reach? Yeah, it's going to be so technologically advanced that that um, I mean, <laughs> you know, there's a great movie about that. Um, I, well, it's kind of a big art movie by Tarkovsky called Stalker. I don't know if you know about that. You know who Tarkovsky is? It's a Russian I've heard of him. kind of yeah. yeah 
Uh, he made a few like really famous movies like Stalker and Solaris would probably be the other real big ones. Oh yeah. Um, good movie. I mean, they're definitely not gonna, you, you have to give it time, you know? Um, but he's very kind of artistic, but so, but Stalker is based on a story called Roadside Picnic, a, a um, Russian story in which there are these people, there, there's something weird has happened in, in certain areas on earth and it changes people who go into that land and there are these stalkers who will take them in to get items, to collect these items that you can find. And it totally messes with people. Um, just psychologically, there's no, no monsters or anything. But the, the short stories about that these things happen because there was some sort of non-terrestrial beings who just sort of stopped by and had a picnic on their way, you know? And I think it's more likely that that any if any any intelligence or any kind of non-terrestrial entities um, interacted with with the Earth, it's more likely that they would give a shit. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just I mean, we tend to think that we're so formidable, you know. I don't know. I don't awesome. know that we're that formidable, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Intelligence or wisdom? What's more important for a better world? Well, you have to have intelligence, but of course, wisdom it seems to balance morality with intelligence, you know? Intelligence on its own can be, can be pretty evil. I mean, can do bad things. Wisdom by its definition seems to not include doing bad things. It seems to be balancing, you know, intelligence with, with experience or, you know. Yeah, nice. And then uh, final question, if your life was a movie, how would you want it to end? I don't know, <laughs> with my death. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I, it would be difficult for me to imagine my life as a movie. I mean, I think everybody, because we watch, I think today people wouldn't think their life was a movie. I think your question should be if your life was a video game, how would you? <laughs> when I grew up, we dreamt movies, you know? Yeah. And, you know, TV was in black and white back in the 50s and, six, and into the 60s. And movies were a lot black and white. And people used to dream in black and white. People used to ask you, do you dream in color or black and white? Because we, but now nobody asks that because everything's in color, right? Nobody dreams in black and white. But I think that we watch movies and, or we listen to stories around the campfire or they listen to the Homeric epics, you know, and people, that becomes the narrative of their life. And I think with movies, we watch movies, and certainly when I was growing up, where movies were the big thing. And you tend to look at yourself, your work, you tend to see yourself in regular life as though you were a protagonist of a movie, that you were in a movie, and you act like what you see in the movies today people probably act like what they see on a reality show they watch big brother they watch survivor or they watch the kardashians and that becomes how they see themselves or they watch a influencer a social media influencer and then they become like that they all of a sudden they watch people opening packages on youtube and now when they open a package, they're doing it yeah. with that as the model. <laughs> and I think that you're, so for me, the, the idea of my life as a movie, I don't know. I, I mean, I couldn't even imagine what the, what the narrative is. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea, right? And if I did try to make a narrative of it, I would just be inventing something else. I would 
I would be trying to make a movie out of it, which means I'd pick from a handful of narratives that movies <laughs> usually have. There's not that, you know, I mean, some, what do they say that there's, I mean, there's different, different versions of this, but that there's like 32 different stories that you can tell a movie, you know, and you can't do any more of it. You know, it's, there's a, every movie you see is a variation on a movie you've seen. Yeah. Um, but I think that young people today um, spend way more time with video games than they do with movies. And I think that has to be how they see their, their world. Because, I mean, I used to go to the movies a lot, but people binge TV, yes. But young people, they just, they're playing Call of Duty for three hours, four hours. And they're talking to their friends while they're playing whatever the Roblox or I don't know what, what these, all these games. And I think that that maybe, maybe is, I think maybe that's your better question. <laughs> Yeah. If, if your life was a video game, how would it end? With me winning. <laughs> right? Nice. I defeat the boss. Awesome. <laughs> Sounds like a good way to end it. <laughs> end it off on a bang. <laughs> yeah, I mean, most people indeed spend most time watching or um, playing video games, but I still spend my time watching movies like Reanimator or The Dentist. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot to be, I mean, the thing about movies is one of the, one of the better pleasures for me is watching what would be considered old movies um, and kind of, kind of looking at them from a critical point of view. And it's kind of like going, (laughs) I hate to say it, but it's kind of like going to an art museum and seeing these paintings and the more you know about them, the more pleasure you get out of them, you know? And I think with movies, the more you see the evolution of the move, of the type of movies that you like, of course, there's too many movies to, yeah. to see, to get outside of one narrow area. But I like um, expressionistic movies, you know? I like the, from Fritz Lang or, um, I, I think the best um, vampire movie ever made was Nosferatu, the original. I mean, it's just way, I, that kind of, I'm not looking for reality. I'm looking for for something that's expressionistic. That is, and, and that really started in the 20s. And that's what I like about genres. It's, it's not really, it, you know, with horror movies, a lot of what I like is horror movies that are like, you know, theme park rides, you know, that are a lot of fun. They're it's a lot of fun. You know, it's horror, but it's fun. You know, it can be a ride. But then there's movies that are more that I admire um, because I don't know. I have appreciation for them. I see how they're connected to other movies, and I think that there's a great deal of pleasure to like just watching every Val Luton movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> watching all the the, um, the universal horror movies, even though only about four of them are any good. <laughs> you know, but, you, but, you know, you just watch them all, you know? Yeah. I don't know, you know, or just, you know, the, all the crazy movies of the 50s, you know, The Fly, with Vincent Price, you know, the William Castle movie, or... You know every Hitchcock movie. Yeah, you can't go wrong watching Hitchcock. And, you know some of them aren't very good, but but in general he's he's got a style. You know, and he yeah. kind of builds that suspense. He tells the story well, and that's kind of a you know when you're just stuck with the modern stuff, you're just waiting. You know, it's kind of like you're watching a whole lot of movies to find something special. When you look backwards. All you see are the special ones because all the rest have been lost. You know, they're not, nobody, they're not around. So yeah. you can, it's harder to get into because you've got to transpose yourself into that reality. But you, but you can, might have a better chance of seeing something 
that you really like than if you're just watching every every Walking Dead movie today. <laughs> right. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, makes sense. <laughs> awesome. Is there anything you would like to add to the interview? We've. No, I will tell you by the way. Thanks for having me. Huh? This has been the longest interview I've ever done. This was such I a don't great know. time. Okay. Right. Well. Thanks for having me and good luck. And I hope you have a, you know, can make your movie. Thank you so much. Bye bye. All right. All right. Oh, if you start to be today, the light. You again. You again. I know you got a better later. Listen up. Listen up.